Good morning, my name is LaShonda and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the APM Global User Community Webcast. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now like to turn today's call over to Mr. Keith Palmer. Mr. Palmer, you may begin your conference. Keith, are you on hold? Keith, are you on mute? we lose him? Uh, Manish, uh, Keith was disconnected, so can okay. you uh, make the announcements, please? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you and welcome to our November 2013 CAPM Global User Community Webcast. Uh, we have an exciting topic today, but before we begin, uh, just a couple of announcements. One, um, as, as, you know, as always, Please put your Q&A, um, any questions you might have, um, into the Q&A section and not in the chat. Um, number two, we, we definitely want to thank you from the our board members for a great year. Uh, we got some great participation on the board, um, on the discussion um, website, and as well as participation for the webcast. So we really thank you for that, and hopefully we can have a, a great year in 2014. Speaking of 2014, we as the board members uh, have put together some strategies um, for webcast for 2014, and we're going to post that as a thread uh, under the APM general discussion. So we would want you guys all to please go ahead and um, provide your feedback under that thread once we post it. Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have it posted by the end of this month, um, and uh, we look forward to the 2014. So before further ado, uh, I want to go ahead and hand it over to Mike Sidor. Um, he's going to present um, today on um, high availability scenarios and solutions. He's, a, he's the CA Senior Engineering Services Tech Architect. So take it away, Mike. Thank you, Manish. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, if you haven't heard me speak before, I tend to, uh, to jump right into it. So uh, just for a quick summary, if this is the first time you're hearing the, the voice of APM, uh, I'm the lead for the best practices, so uh, I'm really focused on how to make customers successful uh, with APM technology, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's my particular mission. Uh, everything I work with is, is the real deal. So uh, the things we'll talk about today are from the exact experiences uh, that, uh, that we have. So. Uh, I think you'll all find it kind of enlightening. Um, I want to preface the, you know, we're, we're going to lead to high availability, um, but uh, really what we're going to focus on is a failover capabilities and techniques for CA APM that lead to a high availability uh, solution. So the, uh, the first thing that, uh, let me make sure I get the right part here. Uh, I want to do is just make a couple definitions because this is a very uh, emotional uh, topic and, and you know, uh, the, the language seems to be interchangeable between failover and high availability and they're really two different things. Uh, and there's also some other things like backup. You know, a backup is specifically something we do to facilitate the recovery of a component and its data. Uh, failover is a characteristic of a component within a service where control is transferred to the next available component in the same role. So what we really talk about with, uh, with failover is failing over to a like component, um, not a different service or anything like that. High availability is in fact a characteristic of the service, which is comprised of many components. Uh, for our conversation, the service we're really concerned about is the APM cluster. 
uh, and we'll look at the different failover modes and uh, and it's my goal to make sure everybody understands exactly what uh, what works and what doesn't work well you know in terms of our individual uh, component of failover capabilities um, and then also related uh, to this topic is business continuity or you know uh, that's the polite term and then disaster recovery is the the realistic term um, what happens if you lose a data center uh, and this is also a situation that APM is asked to uh, to participate in but um, here it's the characteristics of a business to maintain its services after rare catastrophic events so one thing that we can use to kind of distinguish failover in this conversation is that these are not rare events uh, they occur for all kinds of different reasons uh, generally, the reasons are a misconfiguration, uh, inappropriate hardware, or a hardware failure. Uh, those are the things that are going to affect a component. And uh, so we want to really understand the strategies on, on how we can manage that for APM to, uh, to good result. Um, so the agenda, first off, this is a complex topic. It's going to go in a couple different ways. There's really no clean way to, to kind of ease into this. So. Uh, so I really want to focus on a couple of questions. Uh, what do we need failover to achieve? What does APM offer? What are the hard realities? All right, the stuff we can't uh, uh, get away from, what I basically call the laws of physics. And then what are the best solutions that are available today? And then I'll try and wrap all these uh, things uh, into uh, a couple points to, uh, to close up, and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. So when we look at the broad spectrum of, of topics that we can talk about, and, and I just always put this out here to let people know that APM is a very rich repository of interesting things to talk about. Um, and these are all things that happen, you know, six months after your first installation of APM that you start to appreciate and understand and, and address some of these issues. So way down here in the weeds is, is failover and backup uh, strategies, which is what we normally would associate with a pre-production process. So as you guys are planning a deployment uh, or a successive deployment and maybe you're moving on to a cluster or maybe you're starting to migrate a couple of clusters, um, different uh, use cases will then be applied and different goals for what the service should be able to achieve will be considered and that's usually how these topics come up. These are not topics for the first time you do an install or maybe even the tenth time that you install. Uh, these are really topics that come uh, in what we generally call organizational maturity. So as the organization matures with its use of APM, it starts to become a little bit more dependent on that data and once they have a failure for whatever reason uh, in the environment and APM is uh, unavailable, then the question moves very quickly to, uh, to fail over uh, strategies and high availability and, and, and what should be done. Um, it's important to realize, uh, and again, this is the easiest way to, to do this is graphically, that it's not the first consideration for people to think about. There's a lot of stuff you have to have in good order before you're even in a position to worry about failover. So uh, I use these as basically, you know, a mantra to yourself to understand what your skills and capabilities are. You know, I can deploy agents, I can tune agent configurations, I can health check my APM environment. Those three things alone are probably 90% of what, you know, causes a problem and pushes people to consider failover as a quick way out. But really, there's no quick way out. The failover solutions become uh, very expensive, so they're not going to be an attractive way compared to learning how to tell check the environment and better manage the capacity that APM provides. So as we continue to go up through the different skills that you'll have around APM and up to the point where, you know, we know how to, to get that, gather baselines, validate dashboards, audit applications, and plan these follow-on deployments, now you've really got a grasp of all the principles underneath to have a, a reasonable conversation about failover in the context of the solution architectures that you'll be considering. So this is not something you do for two or three collectors, maybe not even one or two clusters. It's something you start to think about when you've got maybe five clusters uh, and, and a business may have a different emphasis for what they really expect the, uh, the information to be available at uh, in terms of, you know, a guaranteed service level. So I usually call this managing the APM lifecycle. When you're focused on uh, the issues of technology selection, training, architecture, sizing, failover, that's when this topic really comes to the fore. 
Um, so it's important to realize that as we talk about failover and, and you haven't even thought about these yet, that's the perfect situation to be in. You should be building up these other skill sets and having these other experiences uh, deployment-wise to start to build uh, not only uh, experience in using the technology, but a strong uh, user base of people who are consuming the metrics information. And it's really when they start to become more dependent on the information that the pressure for a, a, a failover, a fault tolerant, a high availability, these are all the terms that folks will use, that pressure will start to become in, uh, important to the point where they're going to be willing to make investment to see it through. So what do I need failover to achieve? And really this is a big stack of priorities uh, and we have the APM components up at the top uh, and then the APM service availability is the next thing underneath that. But this is just really the rule for APM overall. APM information is nice to have, but the application is where you make your money in terms of what you offer your consumers or how you conduct your business. So the service availability and then the application component availability, these are things that need to be addressed and, and you really should have some experience with those before you start to tackle what are the options and, and pro processes to follow for APM. But underneath these are two very important areas, the network connectivity and then you know, the basic speeds and feeds of power and cooling. If you've got unreliable power, Worrying about failover is a complete waste of time. You're never going to get a good service availability if you can't even have reliable power. Same thing for the network. If your network connectivity is broken, this is going to cause all kinds of performance problems and failover is not going to do anything to help those situations. Another way to look at that is, you know, in terms of components that can fail, uh, and, and this list is completely without any consideration for APM. We've got a lot of things that are more important than what we want to do with APM. And if we don't have a good answer for some of these other areas, then we've got situations where, you know, we can say and be proud of our APM, yeah, this is completely a failover capable, it's a high availability service. Unfortunately, our apps go down two, three times a week for all these other reasons. Um, so this is, uh, again, from looking at it holistically, you've really got to have a good experience with your applications and infrastructure and have that under control before you start to make investments on the APM side uh, in terms of doing something uh, for the component failover. So for the APM service, the component realities are, are as follow. If there's no network connectivity, we have nothing that we can do about that, and we're, we're dead in the water. Everything that we depend on for information is, is distributed. So whether it's the agents, the collectors, the APM database, the mom, all these things expect to communicate via the network. Um, they're almost never going to be co-located, uh, co meaning that the workloads between a collector and an APM mom are completely different. So if you put them on the same box, you have all kinds of challenges in terms of optimizing the configuration for either one. Um, very often you'll find that the APM database and the mom are co-located. All right, there's different reasons for that. Their workloads are actually a little bit more similar. But uh, the reality is we're in a distributed environment. If the network is unreliable, we're doomed. All right, there's really nothing that we can do to, uh, to build or, or enhance that. In terms of the platform, you know, for physical, our failable capabilities are minimal. You know, if the platform goes down, there's nothing we can do, uh, nothing that we're going to do to detect that. If it's virtual, all right, it's a little bit more reasonable. We can then detect that a mom has gone down or a, uh, a, a collector has gone down and actually then, you know, script and take some actions to, uh, the, to remediate that. Uh, that's nothing that's inherent in the product. That's something that you would do outside, but at least you would have a consistency of communication where you could reliably undertake that action. Um, but basically, once we start to have a problem with the platform, our normal impact is going to be a degraded service. And for most of the problems that we get into, our first response is to degrade the service. And this takes a couple different forms depending on the, uh, the type of component we're looking at. If the JVM uh, fails, uh, basically we're dead in the water. We're completely dependent on the JVM, JVM for all our services. There is no, you know, backup uh, or failover capability outside of that. 
Um, so when we talk about failover, we're talking about the failover of a mom component onto another completely realized platform, hardware, operating system, JVM, everything. Uh, all those things have to be in place before we're even in a position to, uh, to do something. Um, the mom, uh, most of the, the failover capabilities that w we have today are really uh, of a manual nature. Um, part of this is because when a failover event happens, um, we actually have a contention for control of the resource. This is something we've only uh, recently solved with a, what we call a lock file approach. But the bottom line is that uh, making a decision to fail over part of the APM service is not something you do automatically. Uh, you want to understand what the nature of the failure was, and in the case of the mom, you have to make sure the, the uh, you know, so if the primary fails and the secondary uh, begins recovery, you have to make sure the primary doesn't decide to wake up and, and start taking control of the, co uh, the collectors and, and uh, you know, uh, handling the agents and all the other stuff the mom is going to do. So um, it's really, we, we have to throw a switch to, uh, to do anything in, in terms of a, a failover uh, when the mom is involved. The impact of not having the mom, though, is, is pretty, pretty severe in terms of what our stakeholders are going to expect. And that means that we're not getting alerts, we're not getting workstation access, however, all the data is preserved. And that's because it's a distributed architecture. The collectors take care of the data. The mom is only federating access to that data. So uh, in the event we lose the mom, the data is still being recorded. But nobody can get access to it, and no alerting is going to be generated for the platform. The APM database uh, today, uh, we don't have anything. It's, uh, it's really, it's conventional technologies. There's nothing built into the product that helps uh, do failover for this. And the impact if the APM database fails is uh, first the application map and those relationships is lost. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a nice to have thing, but not critical. But then the CEM defects are also being stored in the uh, APM database, and that's really critical uh, in terms of uh, doing diagnosis. So that, that's kind of severe, but today we just don't have a model for uh, doing a, a failover with the APM uh, uh, database. Instead, we look at uh, replication schemes to preserve that data uh, so that we do have a chance to, to use it. And, and we'll go into, you know, what some of the, the, the time delays in, in achieving those replications are going to be like. Another service that uh, we're very uh, much dependent on is the LDAP or the uh, EEM, the Embedded Entitlements Manager. Um, this uh, usually doesn't require any other work on us for uh, a failover capability because they are inherently distributed solutions. So the, there's nothing special that we're doing. We pretty much assume that that's going to be available. In the event that it isn't, we've lost our primary authentication service. So this is not a, an absolute showstopper because you can have a fallback uh, mechanism, you know, through the, uh, the user information that uh, we uh, configure as part of the base configuration. So there still would be ways to access this if you somehow lost your LDAP infrastructure altogether. Um, but the bottom line, this is a pretty severe situation, and uh, 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 we're not doing anything special to, uh, to take care of it. On the collectors, uh, there's no specific uh, failover capability uh, considered. Um, what we've really done in our model is we let the agents uh, actually take care of failover. So if a collector goes down, yes, we've lost the historical data up to 24 hours, uh, but the agents are going to migrate to the next available collector uh, if their configuration allows that. So this is the model that uh, we were originally focused on, is making sure that if an agent was running, it would always find a place to put its data. And this is, of course, because we do very limited storage of the data. Um, so if we haven't been able to transfer the data from the agent to a collector within 30 seconds, we basically drop it you know, in order to manage uh, our impact on the memory of the application. So, uh, so, but this is something we've, we've obviously had a lot of experience, and this is what the original uh, design uh, for the APM uh, solution was uh, really focused on. For the smart store component, there's no failover capability. Um, uh, you know, you may use replication schemes. There's other things that we can do behind the scenes to provide some access to the historical data, but basically you're going to lose uh, up to 24 hours and then there's no chance of, uh, of that, corrupt, uh, of that uh, recovery. If the smart store somehow becomes corrupt, 
all the data is lost. Uh, we really just don't have any reliable mechanism to uh, solve a, a data corruption issue on the smart store. And, and the quickest solution to get the environment back up is to do what I call simply to drop the smart store. That is to stop the collector, rename the directory, um, and you can, you know, once you rename the directory, the smart store will start up and it will create a new directory, uh, and then you've got a, a clean environment from that point forward. And then you can use the rename directory uh, with a historical smart store. So basically a smart store that's configured for uh, only looking at old data, not having any agent connections or things like that. And that will give you a mechanism to, to maybe work on it, maybe find a way to somehow uh, recover some part of it. But generally, it's really, really hard to, uh, to recover a smart store if it becomes corrupted. Um, the way it becomes corrupted is, you know, badly formed data, and generally a JMX is a, is a tremendous offender for this. Um, programmers get to build the, the type of JMX information that they're interested in. They can export that and basically we subscribe to that JMX feed uh, and basically take whatever they give us and publish it. And if they give us, uh, you know, malformed data, uh, it is definitely going to blow up a smart store and this is a situation we've run into a number of times over the last couple of years. For the agent, the failover capability is just give me a collector and I've got somewhere to go. Uh, the impact is typically 30 seconds to a minute of data that might be lost, um, depending on uh, how successful it is and, and quickly uh, reconnecting to a collector. But uh, bottom line, this has been uh, part and parcel of the product since the, the initial releases and, uh, and by far one of our most reliable mechanisms. So getting agent from, or getting metrics from the application via the agent, this is just completely robust, provided we have capacity to, uh, uh, you know, to allow them to connect. So whether it's a standalone configuration where they just collect, uh, connect to the next available collector, or a cluster configuration where they go back to the mom and ask for reassignment to available collector, um, the story here is making sure that we can accommodate the failure of one, two, or three collectors and still have an environment that's going to uh, preserve data and allow the stakeholders to access it and do interesting things with it. Um, one other way to, to look at things in terms of how much investment or how much effort you want to make is to look at what were acceptable failover intervals. So here, you know, worst case is like you don't have anything other than the ability to stand up a new server, you know, restore some backups or, you know, at least a pre-configured uh, installation. And, uh, and basically, you know, worst case I've seen for this is about eight hours and it's really, it's no extra cost in terms of process or administration. Um, if I restore a lost resource from backup with a pre-configured server, you know, I can generally get this down to about four hours of worst case. Uh, if I install a new server and restore backups, but it's in a virtual environment, obviously this is a much lower administration, a much more reliable mechanism, but we are talking about many gigabytes of files. So if you've tried uh, playing around with that on your uh, VMware, um, you know, there's, there's a little bit of work uh, that you need to do to make sure that that's a reliable mechanism. If we do something like a continuous replication to a warm secondary server, you know, now we're down to a situation where it will be about uh, 20 minutes uh, duration to fail over to, uh, you know, a new cluster or, you know, a new set of components. Uh, and that's generally about the best we're ever going to be able to do. Uh, the situation is that when we fail over, you know, a number of collectors to a new mom, there's actually quite a lump of uh, metadata that has to be exchanged between the mom and the collector uh, before it's, it's actually uh, fully associated. And when you've got, you know, eight or ten collectors, uh, this can be a huge startup bubble for the mom, which will actually degrade its performance for up to four hours, which means slower logins, way slower queries, and uh, potentially uh, missed uh, sending of alerts and things like that. And it's because the, the mom is just saturated with this association workload, uh, which is a, a one-time thing uh, until, of course, the, the collector uh, disconnects or does something else crazy again. Um, but in this situation, you know, you, you kind of have to stagger the, uh, the collectors reassociating, and that's generally done at about a two-minute interval. So if you've got ten collectors, you know, you're looking at 20 minutes, and, and that's just the laws of physics. 
Um, if we look at replication, you know, as an ongoing activity for, for backup and, uh, and, and clustering types of efforts, then we're looking at putting about two minutes latency into the process and also, you know, having a pretty large administrative uh, expense to go along with uh, maintaining that type of activity. So, uh, you know, if I was really, really crazy about my APM data, I basically would kick off this process every hour because that's the first stage of, uh, of organization of the data where we go from a, a highly efficient raw format, um, you know, which is highly efficient to write but not so efficient to read, and then we go and we put that into a different file format which then eventually gets bubbled up and starts to become aged as part of the tiering process that kicks off every 24 hours. So, you know, some people have gone and said, all right, then we'll, we'll make a backup every, you know, of, of that spool file. We'll make a backup of that, you know, every hour as, uh, as you know, they get uh, turned over. Uh, that's a little crazy. Most people look at doing a backup of, the, uh, uh, of the, the smart store on the collector every 24 hours because they wait until it reperiodizes and then they can basically go and, and back up that file. And these are all fine approaches when you're talking about a handful of collectors. But if you're talking about a handful of clusters, you know, now you're talking about 30, 40, 50 collectors, and you've really got a quite huge factory process for making sure that these things all get backed up. And that's going to raise some, some questions, and, uh, and really it's right to raise those questions. So what does APM uh, specifically offer for, for failover? Um, the, the main concepts, you know, uh, failover point on the agent is basically a list of the next collectors that it can use, and this has been available for, for uh, you know, uh, forever. Um, when we're in a clustered environment, it's really the mom that uh, we have to, to focus, and having the mom, uh, you know, doing load balancing basically ensures that the agent will get assigned to a collector that uh, will make sense for it. And this has been available since, uh, since version second. Uh, the, mom, the, the collector participating in this kind of cluster, you know, uh, following the mom's load balancing clues has also been available since seven. And then having a, a you know, manual process for failing over the mom has been uh, uh, available since seven. For the APM database, uh, this is just the traditional replication. You know, we're using Postgres technology. Uh, you have an option to use Oracle. So whatever tools they have available, uh, that's really what, uh, what you're going to do to take care of that. And it's generally going to be on a 24-hour cycle, you know. So you've only got one APM database per cluster. So, uh, so if you've got four or five clusters, you've only got four or five of these to back up. And, and the real value in that is, is just preserving that defect data uh, that's coming from, uh, from CEM. Um, so uh, again, traditional replication is the way to handle that. For the mom, uh, when it's a shared file system, uh, which is kind of one of the more dangerous and unreliable configurations, meaning that, you know, the NFS reliability is often worse than the platform reliability. But this is something that we've been doing since version 9. It's not been very successful because the, the NFS itself is, is that uh, the poor availability uh, uh, characteristic. Um, so we uh, recently moved to what we call the lock file, um, and sharing that lock file. Again, the sharing is going to be via, uh, you know, an NFS or uh, at least a file mount, which are, you know, not especially reliable. So this is what we've been doing uh, really, uh, I think it was 9.1 it was first came out, but 9.5 it's been pretty robust and, and that's a model that's going to be going forward. And then, uh, you know, something much better coming someday, and uh, I hate to be uh, purposely vague on that, but I'm actually part of the team that's building the next generation of failover uh, capabilities. So I know exactly what the future holds and when it comes out, and unfortunately at CA Policy, if it's not GA, I got nothing to say. So uh, yes, we're very focused on this. We see that, you know, the available solutions we have are, are not terribly uh, useful. Uh, they are reasonably effective, but there are still bigger things that we have to, uh, to address, and it really comes down to what are the things that we want the, the failover uh, solution to achieve. So some things to, to think about, you know, uh, the first step in any mom collector failure is to try and fix that EM. And this is really 90% of when people are asking us for failover. It's because the environment crashed and, uh, and they were embarrassed in the whole situation. 
However, the reason for the environment crashing was painfully obvious. It said the environment was saturated, they weren't paying attention to it, and the thing has dropped down. Uh, the solution is not failover. The solution is to, to do a health check, learn that process, learn how to use the performance information that we're giving you in order to let you know that you've run out of resources. Um, this is just a classic, you know, uh, you know uh, debutante user of APM problem. Um, people seem to think that because we can survive almost anything, that we'll grow forever. And, and we don't. We have a very hard limit in terms of the number of metrics or number of agents that we can support. Uh, we have very hard requirements for the hardware that's needed, uh, especially people who are moving to virtualization. Their first virtualization effort with the APM almost invariably results in a disastrous failure and a massive escalation. Uh, and this is really, it's just people getting used to using those technologies and maybe going a little bit too fast in terms of how they deployed it before they actually had uh, reasonable uh, experience. The second thing is make sure your license files are available for backup EMs. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, accessing a license and getting that bit of information, um, you know, we don't count the number of enterprise managers for license purposes, but we do have a process in place that says a particular license for an enterprise manager is locked to that node. So if you're going to have additional, uh, you know, scenarios that say additional hardware is going to be made available, you've got to have those licenses made available up front. Uh, otherwise, you're going to add a potentially a couple hour delay into restoring the service, and it could be avoided just with some, uh, some advanced planning to, uh, to get those licenses. Uh, backup moms, you know, creating a new mom instance from scratch is very fast. Its use of the smart store is tiny, so copying is fast. It's uh, really not that big a deal, but uh, people do kind of have a goal that these things should happen automatically, and the reality is, is we're just not there yet. Um, we have to uh, concern ourselves with the outside for, you know, resources, which means how do we integrate the alert streams, for example, with, uh, with the different moms. So just because we can quickly bring up a new mom doesn't mean that a Tivoli is going to recognize that mom for sending uh, alert messages and things like that. So again, uh, uh, advanced planning is the solution here to make sure that you try out your failover scenario and make sure that these other resources are going to recognize uh, the new mom uh, uh, should, should you have to, uh, to do something like that to bring it up. And of course, the firewall rules and stuff like that and, and the collectors and the network connectivity, uh, this is just the reality. So all failover solutions, whatever you decide to go for, is something you actively have to test and make sure that the, the components that you want to move in are actually going to be able to function uh, once they get into the, uh, into the operating environment. Uh, same thing for backup collectors. The, the main focus here is because they are usually distributed, uh, it's just going to be firewall rules. Uh, there's nothing that says you can't add, uh, you know, additional collectors, uh, you know, beyond our, our uh, you know, 8 to 10 is the, the typical number of collectors that we have with a cluster. Uh, but that's really to manage the amount of metrics information that's exchanged. Uh, you can always have another three or four collectors attached to that same cluster provided they're not gathering agents, you know, or metrics from the agents. So if, uh, if they're in a reporting capacity or some other idle type of mode, it's no pain to the mom to, uh, to keep that association and have that ready to go. Uh, but then you do have to have a manual process which basically says, I'm going to have a different set of configuration files when the mom is in its normal mode and when it's in its failover mode. And basically you're commenting and uncommenting different collectors to accommodate the scenarios that you want to uh, uh, support. Um, you cannot combine smart stores from multiple data collectors. Uh, this is something that people have asked for and continue to try. Um, uh, and again, it's a focus on, you know, if, if the smart store uh, received a metric, that metric is, is somehow sacred. And, uh, and if we're going to preserve it for a year and, and you know, uh, on this collector we ran out of space, so we moved over to another one, and now we want to merge those two things together, it, it just doesn't happen. The, the challenge is that the smart store is not a traditional database. I mean, it, it is absolutely a database. It's a hierarchical file system. It's one of the first databases that were put together back in the 60s. 
Um, the benefit is that it's highly optimized for time series data, which means that all the relationships that we're concerned about is where do I find that particular piece of data, and it's all done by calculating offsets. However, once you introduce a small error into that offset, you basically killed access to the, uh, to the data store. And uh, so it's kind of fragile when it comes time to uh, insert things that are out of order. And of course, we also have a situation where the timestamps are a very important bit of information. So whenever we you know, have tried and looked at migrating different uh, uh, smart stores together, the time sync of their data is something that can present a problem in terms of calculating these offsets. So the bottom line is that you know, we really have to take a pragmatic look about the data, the access to the data, and we have to look at other techniques that help us make sure that we're getting valuable information and not simply waiting for an event sometime in the future to start looking at the data. You know, we want to be looking at the smart store information on a periodic basis, pulling baselines, pulling relationships, pulling KPIs, so that when we do have a data loss, it's not really going to impact how we do the analysis. So what are some of the hard realities that we have to consider? Well, as I've been kind of uh, softly moving into this, it's about the smart store data value. Um, we've had this feature and capability, and it's been quite attractive for many years, where we're going to give you a year's worth of data online. And, and this is a great marketing feature, and it's a great competitive advantage. But the bottom line, the value of the data actually declines very rapidly, uh, even though we have this ability to keep it around. And, and you know, it, it's been obvious to me over the many years. It may not be obvious to you. So let me just give you a very tiny example of why this is the case. You've got application X that went to release one a year ago, and then 1.1 and 1.6, and then they made a whole bunch of big changes, and they went to the 2.0 version. And that went through a couple different releases, and now they're up to 3.0. And, uh, and this is worse than comparing apples and oranges, which are at least the same kind of fruit. You know, maybe the 3.0 version went from, you know, a uh, remote procedure call interface to web services. It's got nothing in common with the information that was there previous. So there is really no value in having a year's worth of data over an application that is continually changing. See, because there's nothing I'm going to go back and refer to because those components that I'm looking at now for web service simply didn't exist when the application was first put together. Now, this is a severe example, but this, this is the bottom line. If you don't look at the data in an active uh, time frame, you really don't get a lot of value out of it. And this is a really a big challenge, uh, you know, in my role to help people understand that you need to be look at the data in an ongoing process. And people have to be making use of it when it's timely and when it means something to the environment. Uh, in terms of the application lifecycle. And then having it around, yeah, it's kind of convenient. It's, it's more convenient when I go in and health check an APM environment because now I can look back three months, six months, hey, we also got a benefit from having that data around for the year. But generally, we simply don't change releases that frequently. Um, and uh, and it, this is you know probably the easiest way to understand that just because you have a year's worth of data doesn't mean it's going to help you solve today's problem. Uh, and that's, uh, that's really the point I want to get across there. The second really, really tough issue about APM is that if you really want to support failover, you cannot run your collectors at 100% capacity because, you know, you very quickly are just going to destroy the cluster in the event that you lose one collector. So what do you actually need to do? To, uh, to support one, two, or three collector failure and, and have a, you know, a certain uh, you know, rated level of, uh, of service availability for the APM environment. So I, you know, I've gone through and done these calculations. It shouldn't be any surprise. It's just a little magic spreadsheet here. But basically, if I want to allow a single collector failover and I've got eight collectors in my cluster, I cannot exceed 88%. And what that means is when that collector fails, those agents are going to be all sprayed over the surviving collectors in one to two minutes. And if those collectors are running hot, there goes the cluster. And again, this results in lots of support calls and stuff like that. And uh, when we drill down and find out what's the real cause, the real cause is the, you know, the cluster was saturated before the problem occurred. And then it just amplified and magnified it, uh, you know, uh, with a, a cascade of uh, collector failures and ultimately bringing down the cluster. 
Um, sometimes this situation will be going on for months before uh, you know we get involved to really go in and give the customer some guidance as to what's going on. So in, in our experience, we know it's because no one is managing the performance information, the performance KPIs about APM to proactively avoid these types of outages. So the call when these situations occurs is, hey, if your stuff was failover capable, we wouldn't have this problem. And I'm like, failover to what? All right? We do have failover capabilities, but if you don't plan for it and accommodate it, so if you want to allow a double collector failure, you cannot exceed 75% on your collectors. And that's not negotiable. That's it. If you do, you will bring down the cluster, and, and then what's the point of, uh, you know, all the work that you went through to, uh, to build it up to that point? So uh, just to summarize why cluster capacity is important, and, and this is something you get straight from our performance and tuning guide, a cluster operates as fast as the slowest collector. So part of the motivation for having load balancing and letting the mom make decisions about where to allocate agents is to balance the workload across the collectors. Because when it becomes unbalanced, the whole performance of the cluster suffers. And this is just really a side effect of federation. When the mom makes a request for information about a particular agent, that agent's data can be on any collectors. And, you know, depending on the time range and stuff like that, um, it, you know, uh, an agent can have visited many collectors and it's, and it's you know, even a, a two or three month period. So if somebody goes and does a query to pull back all that information, basically the mom is waiting for all the collectors to say, either here's my data or I don't have any more to send. And the slowest participant is just going to hold up the whole show. And uh, the end result is you're going to see poor performance on the, uh, on the mom. Um, an overloaded collector does not fail outright. It degrades service in an attempt to survive. And what do we mean by degraded service? Number one, drop the data. Number two, drop the mom connection, force the mom to reassociate, you know, uh, make my bed, fix my dinner, do all these other things. I'll oh, forget it. I still don't want to talk to you. Go ahead, make my bed, fix my dinner. It's crazy. It's a petulant child at that point. But that's what the collector is going to do in an attempt to get some time to recover. It's going to basically take that association request and use it to stall so it can finally catch up on its other tasks and the real workload gets transferred to, to the mom in terms of just some extra uh, activities it needs to do. And then the, the third part of the degraded service is that the agents are going to start thrashing. And remember, the agents are highly optimized for failover, which means they do it very, very fast. And in the case of an overloaded or a underperforming cluster, this is going to result in terrible performance degradation on the collectors and then eventual failure of the cluster. And, I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute train wreck. When a collector fails, uh, the agents are very quickly assigned you know, so if we don't have excess capacity, it's a domino effect. You know, you're going to bring down collector after collector, and really, once you've brought down two or three collectors, the other ones are just dead meat because now they're at 150, 175 percent, and uh, there's just no way they can uh, survive that. Um, if collectors and agents are thrashing, uh, the mom will degrade works, first the workstation access, then alerting, and then crash or recycle. Um, so, uh, so the mom's at the end of this uh, this panic storm. Um, but basically, you're not going to get a lot of evidence about how it's happening except to, uh, to look at the log files uh, because you won't even be able to, to, to log in on the workstation. So when this happens, this is also what causes people to, their, their first instinct is to say, ah, you know, I need a failover solution because I can't log into my mom. And the reality is, is you can't log into your mom because, you know, you're trying to run eight collectors on, on a box you found on the loading dock. And uh, you just don't have the hardware to make that work. And now it's in a, in a crisis situation, and guess what? The first thing it does is it doesn't let people log in until, uh, it, until hopefully it can turn itself around. Um, in terms of inconvenience, you know, uh, there's a couple different levels, but basically it's, it's losing historical data. And as I mentioned, losing historical data is, is really not such a bad thing. Uh, the emphasis should really be on not so much the preservation of data, but giving timely access to the data and, under, and making sure that people understand how to extract the KPIs, how to use that information, and then apply it immediately 
to decisions they're making about whether or not an application gets deployed or in the event of a triage uh, incident in production, what are the likely causes that they should look at to, uh, to get that problem uh, uh, remediated. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the best case that we're going to see for failover of a MOM component or the cluster itself is really on the order of five to 20 minutes depending on how many uh, collectors are in the cluster. Uh, and that's just, that's just the laws of physics in order to start that up in a, in a reasonable time. Um, you know, if we look at uh, MOM in an active-active model, which is one architectural bit that I'll show you, uh, we can shave off about half the time uh, because we've already got part of the collectors associated uh, for a given number of applications. And then uh, automatic failover, it simply doesn't exist. Um, you know, the bottom line, the best thing that we can do is, is have a tw five to 20 minutes loss of alerting, workstation connectivity, additional failures of, this, of a file system uh, are, are possible. But, uh, you know, it, it really, it just depending on the size of the, the cluster is what's going to set your recovery time. Uh, whether you use manual techniques or scripts or, you know, pre-stage licenses and stuff like that, those are all to give you the best possible chance. But the worst case is it's generally always going to be in the order of uh, five to 20 minutes. So what's, uh, what's an example of the solutions that, uh, that we have today? Uh, the first is a standalone collector failover, uh, which is usually a pair. And, uh, and really, everyone who has built these, and I'm looking at 11 years of experience on this particular model, um, they just won't run them at 50% load, which is what you have to do because, you know, when you lose one, the load all drops onto the, uh, onto the survivor. And, uh, and people think that, yeah, we'll just operate that degraded for, you know, an hour or two, and it turns out to be four or five. But the first point of degradation is you can't log in to get to the data. And if you do, you, when you try to do a query, it takes 20 minutes to return. So it's all but unusable. You know, it survived. It's still up. Uh, but if your only criteria is the system remained, you know, up or available, um, you're actually not doing your stakeholders any benefit because they can't use it. They simply cannot access the data. Uh, if it's a mom only, again, it's also going to be a pair. And, and you know, successful models today are, are using this shared uh, lock file. Um, and, uh, and this next example that I'll show you. But the cluster, uh, what we call mom and the kids, this is an active-active and where all the collectors are at 49% uh, load, of course, and, uh, and we're not using anything fancy except traditional change control and replication. Um, so basically it looks like this. And the real trick to this model is not something that we're doing with the collectors, it's something we're doing with the applications. So both DCA and DCB have the same 10 applications, but only applications 1 to 5 are active on DCA, and then applications 6 to 10 are active on DCB. So both environments are fully running, uh, so they're both is what we call an active-active configuration, and they each have the same number of collectors, but these collectors can take the additional load of the applications that are not yet running. So we get to this 40% capacity, you know, or you know, 49, whatever the number is going to be for you, simply by only having half of the environment running. So if we lose data center B for whatever reason, mom, collector, agents, apps, network, who cares? Then I simply start those other applications up, those agents associate with the mom onto the, the collectors, and you have now got 100% of your service available, and you didn't do anything funny in terms of you know exotic you know, uh, potentially fragile solutions, dependent on NFS, anything like that, you've got an environment that's actually going to be quite, uh, quite handy. And the failover time is now just really the time for, you know, if, if uh, say, example, we lost the mom in, in cluster A, we can have a choice to either restart the applications that were missing in cluster B or to allow those collectors to reassociate, and that would be done via script with mom B. So in that case, now we're only looking at half of the collectors to start up, and we got a potential worst case time of down to 10 minutes. In this time, no data is lost. It's simply we have to allow that 10 minutes for the, the clusters to reassociate, and then people would connect in through mom B, and they would see their data, and it would be a beautiful time. And this is today really the best way to do failover 
that gives us all of the features that people want. It gives them a business continuity. It gives them a real emphasis on application failover first and what they can do with the mom. In this case, both moms are up and running, so we're really limited to just the collector reassociation, and we are good to go. So we've got a lot of scenarios that are covered in this model. Uh, the clients using this are not referenceable, meaning that, you know, we permission to talk about it, no names can be applied, but this is uh, really the most successful model we have for, for failover today. So I'm going to skip that summary slide here because we're starting to run uh, uh, short on the time and I just want to close on a couple points. Because uh, I had kind of a funny thing here that, you know, <clears throat> I guess I was spending too much time on the road this la last week. I was in Scotland, it was nice. But um, so I said late show, you know, top five reasons for an APM failover initiative. And, and you always know that, the, you know, the first couple are, are kind of reasonable and, uh, and the next, you know, as you get down the list, they become unreasonable. So the top five, which is really the number one reason for an APM failover initiative, is because the alerts from APM are the primary source of application status. Um, I have a handful of customers who are at this stage. These are the customers I'm working with to design the next generation of failover capabilities. Um, they depend on alerts from APM more than they do from infrastructure management. And that is a rare situation, all right? We all know that there are lots of different alert streams and APM is really designed to be a partner, but for a couple customers, they have really moved to the next generation and said, APM is all we depend on. That's our best model for getting it. Uh, consumers of APM information have grown tremendously, you know, uh, top reason number four. That means so many people are dependent on getting access to those KPIs, that baseline information, trending what's going on with the performance information, that they, they can't accommodate any more slowdowns on workstation login and stuff like that. Again, a very, very great problem to have and a good reason to consider a failover architecture. Um, number three, we made significant investments to build our data landfill, and we are worried that the data might be missing when somebody actually starts to look at it, and, and they're really going to be annoyed at us. Um, and, of course, this is not at all a good reason. The, the real issue here is you don't have anybody using the data, and, uh, and it's like, you know, well, boy, when they start, it's really going to be chaotic, so we better make sure that this thing is going to handle the load when they finally figure it out. Uh, this is a very, uh, almost an anti-pattern for a successful APM initiative. Number two reason, and really among the most popular, ABM availability is poor for reasons that we cannot explain or prefer to ignore. It comes right back to those, the, that hierarchy of needs thing that I put earlier. If you can't do a health check, don't talk about failover yet until you understand how you dug this hole and drove yourself into it. And then number one, and this is kind of what I use tongue in cheek, you know, why are people interested in failover for APM? The data is nice to have. The historical data really is not going to make my business more successful or not. Uh, it's whether people make good business decisions based on that data in the instant, you know, in the couple days. Um, but basically, hey, this is a great system to practice failover concepts on because it is relatively compact and the relationships are well known compared to a traditional service. So it's a great resume booster. Anyway, I don't know what you'll think about the uh, top five reasons, but that's something else. And then, uh, you know, a few more points to kind of solve up here, um, uh, to throw up here, uh, but I'll let you, uh, you know, look at these slides on your own time. Um, value performance data lost, really, you have to use it when it's fresh. The older it gets, it's not going to be that much of a value. Um, and certainly, you know, we want to balance this with what the real business needs are going to be. And the best way to understand what your failover needs are going to, to grow to is to make sure that your stakeholders are actively consuming the data, actively using KPIs, developing KPIs, baselines, and stuff like that. So um, the bottom line, when you become dependent on the alerts, you've absolutely got to do failover. Until that point, you've got a lot of other work to do with your stakeholders to get them going. Uh, restoring visibility into real-time systems or real-time visibility into key systems is the first priority. And APM, yeah, as quick as uh, we have time and resources to restore that, we'll get that going as well. And that's really what, the, what most customers end up doing. So, uh, so let's take some questions. To ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster.
And that's star one on your telephone keypad. And there are no questions at this time. All right, super. Then, uh, then I'll wrap up my bit just by uh, reminding everybody uh, there's a wonderful book out here. Uh, you don't have to wait for me to show up on a user conference. You can go out and uh, really learn how to manage an APM initiative. Um, understand more about the different concepts I talked about, but basically how to plan, implement, and, and you know, uh, utilize best practices around APM. Get it at your Amazon. Maybe win a Kindle. Uh, we're starting to put the book on there as an extra bonus. Um, so uh, just something that should be part of your library. Um, I'll thank everybody for their time, but I think the, uh, maybe Kevin will come back in to talk about the survey. Yeah, Mike. Um, hey, it's Manish. Um, one of the questions from the audience was, would you be able to share your slides with the um, community? Yeah, I think, uh, do we normally allow download for these, or I, I can put them up on the community site? Uh, um, you, there's actually a number of cookbooks and, uh, and other papers that under APM that you'll find on the community site that you guys should uh, take an advantage to, uh, to look at. But, um, you know, um, for, for CA customers, I think, you know, this is a, a fine enough resource to share. So uh, I'll put it up okay. on the community site if, if it can't get downloaded now. Yeah, because usually we, we put the recording up there, but then I think what – a couple of the um, community members wanted an actual deck. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. You know, the, the, the way to get a successful failover uh, proposal is, you know, start with some source material. And, uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, that, that's what I try to encourage with, the, with all the artifacts that we make available, you know, for, uh, for APM. So whether it's examples from the book or topics like this, you know, um, I really look at them as seed material for starting your own proposals internally. So, uh, so I'll make sure that gets up there. All right, thank you. And um, one last um, announcement is um, we were going to go and put up the survey for um, that came came in from CA, and um, I think Mary will provide the link in the chat window. So please go ahead and take the survey. There will be a random drawing to give away uh, about up to five Kindle Fire tablets. Um, so please take some time and and. Uh, um, Take the survey, and also, if you don't mind, taking the poll questions that's on your webcast currently, uh, so we get some feedback from you. So, with that being said, um, I hope everyone has a good day and uh, has a great holiday uh, vacation, holiday season. Uh, Merry Christmas, thanks, uh, happy Thanksgiving, and a happy New Year. We'll see you guys back in January. This concludes, this concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.